Hi, so today we're going to take some notes on the first two sections of our gradebook. 1.1, getting started, and 1.2, measurement of segments and angles. So on your next right page in your notebook, you're going to want to title your notes. Um, it's a good idea also to put the date somewhere on the page. And then your EQ, or your essential question, is the question that you need to be able to answer at the end of the notes. So how do I recognize and name basic geometric figures? Your second essential question is how can I measure segments and angles, classify angles by size, name the parts of a degree, and recognize congruent angles and segments? If at any point you need to pause the video so that you can catch up or write some things down, go for it. Once you've written this down, you're going to go over about two or three fingers from the left side and underneath the essential question, and you're going to draw a vertical line all the way down your page. Now we're going to begin taking the notes. Everything that you write down will be written on the right side of that vertical line you just drew. We're going to talk about some terms. We're going to learn how to name them with symbols and how to draw them as a diagram. The first term is point. A point names a location and has no size. You plotted lots of points last year. If you look under the diagram column, it looks just like a dot on your paper. Now technically, a point has no size, but we put a dot on our paper so that we can actually see it. When you name a point on a coordinate grid, sometimes you use an ordered pair. Um, in most of our diagrams that we'll be um, using in this class, we use a capital letter, such as A. That's what the picture looks like. Now when we're talking about it in a sentence or we're trying to sound smart and communicate, we use a capital letter only. We don't have to put the point next to it. You also should be familiar with lines. You connected points last year to create lines on coordinate grids. A line is just straight. It's usually solid, can be dashed, and has arrows on both ends of it which indicate that it actually continues forever in both of those directions. To name a line, sometimes lines are named with lowercase letters such as a lowercase m and they usually look like they're in cursive. Or you can name a line by points on the line and that's probably more what we'll do in here. Such as if I add some points to my line such as x, y, and z, I can pick any two of those points put them together, remember they're capital letters, and then I draw a little tiny line on top, like this. I could call this line XY, but above it I'm going to put a little line with little arrows. Okay, I can use any two of the letters in any order I want. So I could also do ZX. The order of the letters is not important here, and which letters you choose are not important. A line segment is a part of a line. So imagine a long line that continues forever and ever and we just cut out a little part of that. Um, it has a definite length. You can measure how long it is and it looks like it does in the diagram here. On each end are endpoints and these are labeled with also with capital letters just like points are. So we could call this, if we call it C and D, then this would be line segment CD or line segment DC. Again, the order of the letters doesn't matter. But when you're naming a line segment, you're going to put the two endpoints as the capital letters in the name. Above it, you would just put a line without arrows. So we could call this segment CD or segment DC. A ray is also a part of a line that starts at an endpoint, but the other end goes on and on forever. So it's like an arrow, like in the diagram. When we name a ray, we always want to start off with the endpoint. Let's call this C. So when we're naming it, we start with that endpoint. The second letter in the name can be any other point on that ray. So maybe we have K here and L here. So we could call this CK or we could call it CL. You have to have two letters. Now above the two capital letters is um, an arrow pointing to the right. The first letter, remember, has to be that end point right here. 
an angle, which you're probably familiar with, is made from two either raised line segments or a combination of those. They share a common endpoint, so they meet at a point. That endpoint is called the vertex of the angle. There are lots of different ways we can name angles. Let's look at the top one. Um, one way we can name an angle is by the name of the vertex. So let's say this vertex was called point A, so we would call this angle A. The angle symbol looks like kind of like a less than with a little arc through it. So that's one way, and that would be for this one. Um, if you look at the angles down at the bottom, there's several angles, but check out the highlighted one. Let's say we wanted to name that angle. Um, this angle, let's say this um, vertex is L. We couldn't call this angle down at the bottom angle L because we actually have several angles. We've got the second one below it and the highlighted yellow one above it. And then if we put those together, we've got that whole bigger angle. So what we're going to need to do is be a little bit more specific. One thing we can do is we can put a one here and a two here, and we can call that yellow angle, angle one. And now we know which angle. Um, we can also still use letters, but this time, instead of just using one letter, the L, we're going to need to use another two other letters, one from each side of that angle. So maybe we call this one on the left um, M, and this one over here, we'll call it O. So we could call this yellow angle either angle M, L, O, or angle O, L, M. What's really important is that that L is right there in the center, right there in the center of those three letters. A triangle is the union of three line segments. Union means you put it all together and see what you've got. You kind of add them together. If you look on the right, there are three segments. They are joined at their endpoints. Let's say they're labeled J, F, and K. Remember, we're using capital letters always to label points. Um, the way that you would name this triangle is just list those three letters in any order that you want. And in front of it, you're going to put a little triangle symbol. So we could call this triangle JFK. We could call it triangle KJF. We could call this triangle FKJ. You kind of get the idea here. Okay, there's basically two things you can do with all of these pieces of geometry we just talked about. Points, lines, segments, all this. Um, you can either put them together, which is called the union, and is symbolized by this U-shaped symbol. Or you can intersect them. You can see what they have in common or where they cross. So I'm going to show you exactly what I mean. All right, we've got two examples. The one on the left is dealing with union, noticed by the U-shaped. The one on the right is dealing with intersection, noticed by that hill or mountain shape. So let's look at the one on the left. It says segment DB, union with segment BE, union with segment DE. The question wants to know, what does this make? So what we're going to do is we're going to put them together. I'm going to start off, I'm going to draw a segment. I'm going to label its endpoints D and B. Now I'm going to draw segment BE. Well, BE shares a point with segment DB. They both share B. So I know one of the points has to, or one of the ends of the segment has to come off of the B. So maybe I draw it like this. There's BE. Then that is going to be unioned with segment DE. Well, I already have D and E drawn. So if I connect them, there's my segment DE. And if I put all of these together, all together, it creates a triangle. So when I union these three segments together, I create a triangle. So we could call this triangle, put the triangle symbol, and then list any of the three letters in any of the order. So I could call it triangle DBE. That's what a union looks like. Um, let's look at the intersection one on the right. Segment BD intersecting with segment ED. So I'm going to start off by drawing the first one, segment BD. So I know its endpoints 
are named B and D. And then we also have segment ED. Well, ED shares point D with segment BD. So I know that ED has to come off of D. So again, I could just draw it like this. And if I look at this, I want to see this is an intersection, not a union. If this was a union, it would create an angle altogether. But what it's asking for is what do they have in common or basically where do they touch? So I'm going to show you something you can do. If you're not quite sure where these two things touch, I want you to get a highlighter. Start off with maybe a yellow highlighter. Yellow and blue work really well together. And you're going to highlight one of the pieces. So let's highlight BD in one highlighter. Now I'm going to pick a different color. I'm going to choose a blue highlighter and I'm going to highlight the other segment, segment ED, like this. Now you can't really tell here, but when you're using actual highlighters, this spot right in here is where the two colors overlap each other. And if you're using regular highlighters, it would turn green right there. So that part where the two colors touch each other, that is the intersection. It's basically where do they cross? Okay, so in this case, they cross at point D, and the way we name point D is just with a capital letter. Okay, so that first part of the notes was basically from 1.1 of the gray book, which is all the basic building blocks to geometry. We're going to put those together, union them, intersect them, and we're going to create all kinds of different shapes. Um, in the second part, 1.2, that's what we're going to talk about now. The first part is classifying angles by size. I know this is a review for you. Super easy. There's four ways you can classify angles by size. They're either acute, right, obtuse, or straight. So let's think about what these look like. An acute angle might look something like this. Um, and when we're talking about angles, we're talking about this inside part right here. So this acute angle has a measure. If I measured this arc right in here, it has a measure that's less than 90 degrees, but it also has to be bigger than zero or it would not be an angle. So what we say, there's a range of values that acute angles can have. Um, the measure of an angle, which we say, which we write as an M for measure, that's how big it is, and then we put the angle symbol again, we're gonna say that that is greater than zero degrees, but that it is less than 90 degrees. All right, now we have a right angle. You guys all know what this is. They have this special little box in the corner. You know it's perfectly 90 degrees. So a right angle isn't a range of values. A right angle's measure equals 90 degrees exactly. An obtuse angle, as you know, is larger than 90 degrees. It's going to look something like this. Um, but it's also going to be less than 180 degrees. That would make it a straight line, which is the fourth way you can classify angles by size. So an obtuse angle has an angle measure that is greater than 90 degrees, but less than 180 degrees. And then a straight angle just goes, it's just a straight line. If I'm going from this side of the angle to the other side, that equals exactly 180 degrees. So this angle's measure equals 180 degrees. Okay, so you're familiar with degrees. It's just a unit that we use to measure how big an angle opens up. Um, but if we can get even more precise. We can divide degrees into smaller parts, which are called minutes. And 60 minutes make up a degree. We use this little um, tick mark to, re to uh, represent minutes. Each of those minutes can be divided into even smaller parts, which are called seconds. And 60 seconds makes up one minute, and we use the double little tick to represent the seconds. So if you kind of think of this as like a clock, whereas degree is like hours, which breaks down into minutes and seconds, it kind of helps you when you're doing some of these conversions. So for example, here's four examples. The first one says um, you've got 87 and a half degrees. If we wanted to rewrite this without that fraction, we would say, okay, we've got 87 whole degrees 
and then we have half of a degree. Well, degrees can be divided into 60 minutes. Half of 60 would be 30 minutes. So half of one degree would be 30 minutes. So we would continue writing this like this, 30, and then we would put the little tick mark, which represents minutes. So that's how that would look if we rewrote that without the fraction. Let's try that with the second one. 41 and 2 fifths degrees. So again, we've got 41 whole degrees. We use that little circle to represent degrees. And then 2 fifths of, of a degree. So we have to think about what that means. 1 degree is 60 seconds. Sorry, 60 minutes. 2 fifths of that means we would multiply these together. 2 fifths of 60 minutes. Multiply those together. And when we do that, we could put the 60 over 1, multiply straight across, and we're going to get 120 over 5, which reduces to 24. So of those 60 minutes, 2 fifths of it would be 24 minutes. That's what that would look like. Now we can try to go in the reverse way. We can try to take the degrees, minutes, and seconds and rewrite it in just degrees as a fraction. So we're going out in the other way. So if you look at the third one, we've got 60 degrees in 45 minutes. So we've got 60 whole degrees. We have to figure out what fraction of a degree is 45 minutes. Well, one degree is 60 minutes. So we just think, well, what's uh, 45 minutes out of the total 60 minutes in one degree, well, that's going to reduce to three-fourths. So it would be 60 degrees and three-fourths of a degree, or 60 and three-fourths degrees. Let's look at this last one. We've got 179 whole degrees. We've got 59 minutes. That's almost another whole degree. And then we have 60 seconds. Well, we just set up at the top that 60 seconds is one minute. So this part is one minute. Oh, look over here. We've got 59 minutes. Well, if I add the 59 and the one, we've got 60 minutes together. And I know from up at the top that 60 minutes is a whole degree. So rather than writing 60 minutes, I can just add 1 to the 179 degrees. And this is the same as just saying 180 degrees. It's just a fancy way of saying that. Okay, here's another example. You've got this picture. It looks like a couple angles. You see this little, you know, right angle right there, that little box, which means together these two angles make up they make 90 degrees. And then down here it says given and find. A lot of the problems in the book are going to look like this. What's given to you is that the measure of angle ABD equals 67 degrees, 21 minutes, and 37 seconds. Angle ABD, that's this angle right here on the top. They want us to find the measure of angle DBC. Well, DBC is this angle right here. What we know by the picture is that together they make 90 degrees. We know how big the purple angle is. We want to find the green angle. So what we're naturally going to want to do is subtract. We're going to start off with 90 degrees and we're going to subtract the 67 degrees, 21 minutes, in 37 seconds. Now the problem with this is that we can't subtract something in degrees, minutes, and seconds from something in degrees. They're not, they don't have like units. So what we're going to have to do is rewrite this 90 degrees in another way. If I take away one degree from the 90, okay, I get 89 degrees, right? I still have another degree I need to represent. So I can represent that as 60 minutes. Sorry, as, uh, yes, 60 minutes. That would be the one extra degree. So I can have 60 minutes here. 
but I also need seconds. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take away from the 60 minutes, which would be 59 minutes, and I'm going to have one minute left. One minute is 60 seconds. So if I put 60 seconds with that, 89 degrees, 59 minutes, and 60 seconds is the same as saying 90 degrees. So let me rewrite that because that was getting a little messy. So we started with 90 degrees. We want to rewrite that so that it's in degrees, minutes, and seconds. So we said we're going to take one from the degrees. So now we have 89 degrees. We still have another degree left, which is 60 minutes. But we're going to take one from there. So we only have 59 minutes. And then that last minute, we're going to write as 60 seconds. Now I can subtract that 67 degree, 21 minutes, and 37 seconds. The way we're going to subtract is just like you would normally subtract numbers. You're always going to start on the right. So we're going to start with our seconds. 60 seconds minus 37 seconds, that's 23 seconds. Then we're going to go over to our minutes. 59 minutes minus 21 seconds, sorry, 59 minutes minus 21 minutes is 38 minutes. And then if we subtract our degrees, 89 degrees minus 67 degrees is 22 degrees. So this is the size of measure angle DBC. Now what you got to make sure here, you're going to look at the three parts, okay? This one looks good. If this one, if the seconds was 60 or more, 60 or more, you would want to get rid of that, get rid of 60 of those seconds and bump it up to the minutes. So you would add one to the minutes column. Same thing there. If you have 60 or more minutes here in the second column, you would want to take out 60, bump it up to the degrees and just add one to the degrees. So we can do an example like that in class if you'd like. Okay, so congruent is another word we need to talk about. Congruent is kind of like equals, but it applies to pictures only. So when we say, oh, these two angles are the same, we don't say that they're equal, we say that they are congruent. This symbol right here is the congruent symbol. It's an equal sign with a little wiggle on top. So we're gonna talk about angles that are congruent and segments that are congruent and how do we note that. Um, congruent angles mean they have the same measure, and congruent segments mean that they have the same length. Okay, let's go ahead and look at some congruent angles. I'm going to pretend that these two triangles are congruent in every way, angles, segments, everything. So let's go ahead and look at the angles first. Um, let's, we'll say that angle A um, is congruent to angle D. The way that I would note that on my picture is just like I did with one little arc. That means that they are congruent. So we would say angle A, we put the congruent symbol, and then we put angle D. That's how we would physically write it, okay? Let's go ahead and say angle B is congruent to angle E. Well, we would also want to note that with some arcs on our picture, but if I do it like this with one arc, we're going to think that all four of those angles are congruent. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually use two arcs to distinguish the angles. And then again, we would say angle B, put the congruent symbol, angle E. Okay, we could again say angle C and angle F are also congruent. We don't know if they are the same size as B and E or A and D. So I'm going to use three arcs to indicate that those two are congruent. And again, we could write angle C, congruent symbol, angle F. So that's going strictly off the picture. Now, if we were to um, talk about the actual measures of those angles, so now we're not talking about the picture, now we're talking numbers, we would change those congruent symbols right here to equal signs. And then in front of the two angle symbols, we would put an M to represent the measure. So if we look at that first statement, angle A is congruent to angle D, which describes the picture. And we want to now talk about numbers. 
we would change it to look like this. The measure of angle A equals the measure of angle D. In a nutshell, these two statements side by side kind of mean the same thing. The red one describes the picture, the green one describes numbers. Now we actually have an equation, we can plug in numbers. Okay, so again, if we were doing the same thing with the other angles, we would say the measure of angle B is equal to the measure of angle E, and the measure of angle C is equal to the measure of angle F. So there's angles. Now let's go ahead and talk about segments. So we have this idea of segments having the same length or being congruent. Let's say that segment AB is congruent to segment DE. So to show that on the picture, I'm going to put a tick mark through both of those segments, and that's going to indicate to whoever's looking at the picture that those two segments are congruent. The way we would write that, we would just write segment AB. So again, if you remember, that's two capital letters which represent the endpoints with a little line above it. We would say it's congruent, so we put the congruent symbol to segment DE. And remember, I can call segment DE or I can call it segment ED. Same with AB. We can call it AB or BE. Um, we can indicate other segments are also congruent, such as BC and EF. But to indicate that on my picture, so that we don't get those confused with segment AB and DE that are congruent, we're going to use two tick marks to kind of distinguish it. And again, we could just say segment BC, put the congruent symbol, segment EF. We could also say AC is congruent to segment DF by using three tick marks in a similar fashion. So these blue statements right here are describing the actual picture itself. If we were to put numbers to these lengths, um, now we're going to need to change the way this looks just a little bit, and I know this might seem silly, but the symbols make a huge difference. The way that we're going to do that is we're going to take the little bars, the little lines off of the segment part of the statement, and we're going to change the congruent symbol right here to an equal sign. So if we wanted to say, you know, if AB represented 6, which means DE is also 6, we would say AB equals DE. So right here, when you see two capital letters without any line or arrow above it, that actually represents a number, a quantity. And that's why we're using an equal sign. We could also with these say the length between B and C equals the length between E and F. The length between A and C equals the length between D and F. So you're just going to kind of have to get used to some of this notation, but it's actually really, really important. So thanks for getting through this whole video. Um, you're going to go ahead and bring these notes to class next time. We're going to add a little bit to them. And keep in mind, um, if you ran out of page on one of the pages in your notebook, you can just go on to the very next right page. Just all the notes on the right page because we're going to use the left pages for something else. See you tomorrow.